you got to be careful. We're in a bear market ish. Um, you know, there's some some interesting things that are happening in this market right now from a longer term perspective. But the, the trend is lower at this moment, not higher. And so you have to respect that from a technical trading basis. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart, welcoming you back for another weekly market recap here at the beginning of December, featuring my good friend and uh, financial analyst advisor extraordinaire, Lance Roberts. Hey, Lance, how you doing, buddy? I don't know why you're leaning on this so thick today. What do you need? <laughs> well, I know that you want to, you're, you're working hard to help us limit these to an hour and a half, and I'm just yep. buttering you up in case I need to go a little longer. <laughs> you got it. Um, all right. Well, look, um, there's a there's a lot of things to talk about here. And honestly, being pulling the kimono uh, open for folks, uh, there's just been so much going on business-wise that uh, I am parachuting into this. So I don't have my normal list of, of topics uh, prepared. So this is going to be a little more freeform than normal. Um, but uh, doing a quick check of the markets, Lance, it looks like they, they they closed a little bit higher this week, but not all that much. Um, but but if you just were to look at that, you would miss all the activity that happened this week. Um, so why don't you tell us sort of you know what what's notable about what happened in the markets this week, price action wise, and then let's get to the big story of the week, which was uh, the the Fed press conference uh, at the end of the day on Wednesday. Yeah, so and well, that was really kind of also the market this week as well. The, you know, the, the big story this week, obviously, and, and as you said, it, it was really the Fed. Uh, Jerome Powell came out and he was at the Brookings Institution just making his normal speech there. And he made his, his comments. And, and really, if you take a look at the comments of what Jerome Powell said, it was not anything that we weren't already expecting or, or knowing, right? He said, you know, we're going to slow the pace of rate hikes. But we already knew that. That wasn't anything new. Um, yes, the, just by the very nature of the fact that we've been hiking 75 basis points a clip, there was an eventual point to where the Fed was going to have to slow the pace anyway. I mean, they can't keep hiking at 75 basis points at every meeting forever. So just logic tells you they were going to slow that pace. So he basically said, hey, we're, we're to the point now we need to slow the pace of rate hikes. What the market overlooked, though, was his comments that they're going to keep hiking rates. There's nothing right now in the data that suggests that they need to stop or pivot or start reducing interest rates. But markets kind of just overlooked all that. And we had a 3.1% jump in the S&P index on Friday. Now, we had a little bit of sluggishness on Monday and Tuesday. Markets had sold off just a tad. 3.1% jump on Wednesday got us above the 200-day moving average. So from a bullish technical perspective, right, uh, this is this is actually good news. Now, hold on, don't get all excited just yet. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, Thursday and Friday sold off a little bit. Friday was the employment report, which came in a lot stronger than expected. Now, what that suggests, of course, now is that the Fed has plenty of reason to keep hiking rates. Right now, it doesn't put a 75 basis point rate hike back on the table for December, but 50 points guaranteed. And if employment keeps running at the rate that it's going, they're going to keep hiking rates. Now, I know there's a lot of problems with the economic data. There's a lot of problems with the employment data. There's a $2.7 million, uh, $2 million job gap between the BLS report and the household survey. So there's, there's, I get it, right? There's lots of problems with that data. And that will eventually catch up to the Fed. This is that lag effect that we've talked about before is that it takes time. And I had an email this week asking me, what do you mean by the lag effect? What is that? Well, the lag effect is, is just because the Fed hikes rates today, that affects the short end of the curve. So on, in terms of interest rates, that's your credit card rate, that's your auto loans that are three, five years, et cetera. So that's where that rate shows up. Well, that takes time before that rate kind of filters into the economy. So when they hike an interest rate, it takes about nine months for it to filter into the economy to actually start impacting consumption, uh, psychology, as well as spending activity, et cetera, because of the cost of higher borrowing. So that lag effect takes time to show up. So all this will start to show up next year because all these 75 basis point hikes haven't shown up yet. This 50 basis point hike won't come in until September, October next year. 
we'll start to see the impact of these higher rates next year on economic activity, slower economic growth, less inflation. That's what the Fed wants. The frustrating point of this week, if I'm Jerome Powell, and this was a point that Nick Timrose made, he's the Fed whisperer for the Wall Street Journal. He said, look, Jerome Powell did not intend to ease financial conditions with his speech, but that's exactly what happened. That 3.1% jump eases financial conditions because it makes consumers more confident. It's like, oh, the market's fine. Look, we're above the 200-day moving average. I'm going to go spend some money, right? Bull market, bear market's over, bull market's back. We're in to spend some money. Um, that's not what the Fed is trying to do here. So I would not be surprised if on December the 14th at the, at, at the uh, presser following the uh, Fed meeting, that Jerome Powell doesn't try to knock the market down a bit. Yeah, that was actually going to be my question. So thanks for addressing it. Is, would he pull another Jackson Hole where he basically just takes what he would have said, tears that up, and <laughs> talks a lot tougher? I, um, I, think that's, I think that's a real possibility. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. And I, I guess I wouldn't be surprised if we saw you know more folks from the Fed getting trotted out between now and then to try to do some damage control. Yeah, they can't, though. Uh, so the only person that can speak now after today is Nick Timrose because we're in blackout until the 14th. Oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah. I forgot about that. So, um, but, but, but don't be surprised if Nick Timrose doesn't have a few things to say from the Fed. So, right. And, and just for folks that might not recognize Nick's name, um, Nick is a writer for is it Wall Street Journal. Journal. And uh, he basically is, is oftentimes referred to as the Fed's press mouthpiece, where they seem to be sort of feeding him lots of leaks that they want to get out in the in the press that they themselves don't want to say. Yeah, or can't say. Yeah, or can't say. Um, okay, yeah. So, uh, so big question around all this, Lance, which is then I think your answer to this is yes, is, you know, is the market setting itself up here for disappointment? It really does seem like the market heard what it wanted to hear from uh, Powell's presentation this week, but but not really what Powell was trying to communicate. Right. And, and to your point, you know, if you look at what he said, the thing that really seemed to send the market screaming was the time for moderating, moderating the pace of rate increases may come as soon as the December meeting. And basically, That's to your point, Lance, all he said, he didn't say they're, they're, they're not going to keep hiking to where they were planning on. In fact, he, he did say the rate peak will likely be, quote, somewhat higher than September's forecasts. Right. So almost everything else he said was pretty darn hawkish. Yeah. Um, he basically just said, we're going to take a slightly slower path to get there. But to your point, the market just seemed to hear, ah, pivot, you know, <laughs> and it, it ran out and, and started screaming by. So, um, you know, do you think that there is, it's setting itself up for as Q1 starts, we're in the new year and it's beginning to see, oh, you know what, actually, yeah, he's just, he's still moving the train forward that, you know, it start having to realize, man, we, we got to start discounting some of this euphoria we pumped into the market here. Yeah, well, so if you go back to March of this year, we got three point, we were about 3% above the 200 day moving average. And then, uh, sorry, let me say that over correctly. Let's, so if you go back to March of this year, the market got about 3% above the 200 day moving average, right? And so everybody's all excited uh, and lots of articles being written at the time. It's like, oh, the bull market's back. See, we're all good. We're ready to go. We're above the 200 day moving average. Well, and then it immediately failed, went back below it, tested, you know, set new lows at that time. So just because we're above, and then of course you remember back in, in June, the market rallied and we did a 50% Fibonacci retracement, one of those technical things yep. of the decline. And there was a bunch of articles were written by guys like, uh, who's the guy over at State Street Bank that's always bullish all the time? Uh, can't think of his name. Uh, Tom Lee. Oh, Tom Lee. Yeah. yeah, you know, a he's fun always strat. Yeah, fun, fun strat, strat, right? Sorry, sorry. It's, uh, yeah, so fun strat. Um, so he's always like, Google wrote this article that, you know, hey, this you know 50% retracement never fails, always signals a bull market, higher asset prices. Of course, right after that, we failed and went to do lows. Um, you know, so you got to be careful. We're in a bear market ish. Um, you know, there's some, some interesting things that are happening in this market right now from a longer term perspective. But the, the trend is lower at this moment, not higher. And so you have to respect that from a technical trading basis. Um, just because we're above the 200-day moving average, there's a lot of technical resistance just above where we are right now. A lot of previous lows, previous tops going back to earlier this year. So, uh, yeah, I think you know the market has, has had a nice six-week rally. We're very extended here, overbought. 
Um, and, and, and remember, six weeks ago, you and I were sitting here and you have to go pull the video, but we were sitting here talking about how the market was extremely oversold, exceptionally right. bearish. This was a great setup for a trading rally. And we should use that rally to sell into. Now, it, everything's reversed. Everybody's bullish. I just There was an article out today on Market Watch about the bull market's back, right? Because we're above the 200-day moving average. So, you know, be careful. This is where I would be fading this rally a little bit, taking some money off the table, you know, kind of sorting out your portfolio. Um, one thing that's doing exceptionally well over the last couple of weeks are bonds. And that was even an interesting uh, aspect on Friday, uh, you know, in particular, because while yields were higher on the 10-year treasury, okay, because of the so stronger employment report means the Fed's going to be more aggressive about rate hikes. So 10-year treasury yields moved higher, but TLT, the bond ETF, actually has had a lot of monetary inflows actually pulling out a positive return because people are buying it, pushing the price of the ETF up despite higher yields on the actual underlying assets. So, you know, it's interesting. We've seen a lot of inflows into bonds over the last couple of weeks because, you know, this is the, the premise we've had since year one, the beginning of this year, is that as all this kind of buckles together, higher interest rates, collides with economic growth, et cetera, and we're getting disinflation in the economy. Now we're starting to see inflation peak. We're seeing other things peak. Uh, rent starting to come down. That's going to bode well for yields going into next year. Lower yields, higher bond prices. So our bet is still that you know our bond portfolios that we run are going to be doing much better. We'll probably actually do better than equity models next year. Okay. Um, well, let's let's actually touch on that directly here for a minute. I got a bunch of other questions and stuff you you mentioned, so I'll get back to those. Um, so we have been talking a lot on this program for a long time, um, and you've really been setting the foundation for that, Lance. Which is um, uh, bonds have had one of their worst years ever, right? And and the the Treasury uh, bond market has just performed way worse this year than anybody thought it could, right? Yeah. And um, uh, one, there's some degree of oversoldness that occurs, right? And part of that might be some of what we're seeing right now. Um, there's been the ridiculous dollar strength this year um, that has contributed to things. Um, uh, and uh, you know, you have said, rightly so, hey, at some point, the Fed is going to run out of it's going to stop rate hiking, right? It's going to get up to where it it it, it wants to get, and it's going to you know stop there. Or it might not not even make it, right? It might actually break something first, right? And so, as you've been tracking for us, um, the yields on bonds have been going higher this year, to the point where they're now actually providing an interesting alternative uh, to more speculative uh, equities and, and equities have, you know, largely gotten yeah. pretty beaten up pretty badly this, this year. Um, and so now you can actually park capital in, in the relative safety of bonds and get paid for it. And then you have this optionality value that you were just talking about, right? That if, if rates actually start moderating at some point, then mathematically the prices of those bonds are going to go higher. And um, depending upon how, how sub uh, substantially rates moderate. Um, there are certain scenarios we can think of where bond prices could actually go pretty dramatically higher from here, which is not un unusual when you see a really bad uh, outlier down year in an asset class that it sort of has a bit of a reversion of the mean to the snap back the following year. So um, I know we've talked about this at different points in time in this, this program. We've had a lot of people, I've been getting a ton of questions about it uh, just from people, you know, emailing me directly or asking on, on under the YouTube comments. Um, but I understand that you guys at RIA have have now packaged, uh, you know, an investment sleeve, for lack of a better term, but but basically a way for people to take advantage of this opportunity where they can buy into to one of several um, fixed income funds that you you and your team have prepared there to take advantage of, of both the sort of um, higher coupon, higher or higher yield, higher safety uh, opportunity you're talking about here with that that potential upside value kicked in here, right? So can you just describe that for a few minutes for folks? Sure. Yeah, no. So the way the way we the way we manage money is that we manage a portfolio in terms of what we call sleeves. So if you think about the 60-40 allocation, I have 60% in a sleeve of equity. So 
I have a basically I have a portfolio model of all equities. And you say, Adam, you say, hey, I want 60% of my portfolio in that equity sleeve. So we allocate 60% of your money to this equity portfolio. And then you say, well, I want 40% of my money in fixed income. We say, okay, well, what do you want? Do you want tax-free? Do you want treasury? Do you want corporate? Do you want a blend? And you say, I want a treasury bond sleeve because I want the 4% yields on short duration treasuries right now. We say, fine, so we'll put 40% of that. So what we have is we have these different buckets or sleeves of these bond portfolios that individuals can invest directly in. And, and because of what we expect is going to happen next year, uh, for instance, we found, you know, just recently as an example, um, finding four and five month paper for corporations trading five, five and a half percent treasuries, of course, three months, six months, up to two years trading three to four percent. So, uh, as you said, rightly, you know, investors should be able to get paid to put cash to work. And that's and, and basically have a, a return of principal function at the end of the day. Um, on those bonds when they mature. So, but the bet is, is that over the course of the next year, yields are going to come down to track economic growth because there's a very high correlation between interest rates and economic growth. So as economic growth slows because of higher interest rates from the Fed, yields will come down. There's probably somewhere between, depending on the bond that you own and, and the duration, there's reasonably a 30 to 50 percent ability, uh, 30 to 50 percent capital appreciation ability in some of these bond sleeves that we run. So we're real excited for next year that you know those those sleeves that you can invest in basically have a really big potential to even outperform the equity sleeves we have in our portfolio. So we're going to probably see a lot of our clients shifting more and more to those bond sleeves because of the relative outperformance and safety potential for next year. Great. And, and as you talk about all the time, you know, investing is a game of probability. So you're wanting to look at where the risk and re risk return ratio looks most favorable, right? And what I've that's been hearing really from, equities. pardon me? <laughs> that's really not equities next year. <laughs> yeah, that's not equities next year, right? Exactly. But but uh, to put some words in your mouth, correct them if they're wrong. Um, what I believe I've heard from you and other experts is, is hey, we, we haven't seen the risk return profile for bonds be this good in a while than it is right now? Uh, not in my lifetime. Okay. So that's a big statement. Okay. The reason why I wanted to dig into this is the average investor, and of course, this is what I'm hearing why folks are reaching out to me. The average investor really doesn't have a lot of experience investing in bonds directly, right? Um, bonds are, they're a little mathy. They're, you know, they're, they're not, it's not calculus, but it, it, it takes a little bit more math than certainly equities do, where people are just sort of, in many cases, like, I like this stock or someone told me it was good. I'm going to buy it, right? Uh, bonds, a little bit of a different story. You have to really understand the bond math uh, to be successful in this space. And then you guys, you do a lot of um, portfolio construction, right? We've talked about bond ladders. We've talked about, in certain cases, mixing and matching different types of bonds to maximize both the yield, um, but still keep risk relatively you know, under control. Um, I know your your colleague uh, you work really closely with on this is, is Michael Leibowitz. Uh, he was on this channel a few weeks ago, given a great just primer into sort of just understanding bonds in the general math. And folks, if you missed that and would like to uh, would like to benefit from it, I'll put up a link to it here. But you just go to wealthion.com slash bonds and you can watch that whole webinar there for free. Um, but the point is, Lance, is this is something that a lot of people don't have experience and I don't think they have a lot of self-confidence uh, in investing in. And so I, I want to flag this for folks because as they understand what you're putting together here is, yes, every week on this channel, we tell folks they should work with a, a good financial advisor. We tell them if they don't have a good one, they should talk to you and your firm or one of the other firms that Wealthy on endorses. But this sort of sleeve that you're talking about here, the, to, people can take advantage of it without having to become a, a full client of, of real investment advice and move all their assets over there. They can still work with their existing financial advisor or if they're a DIY investor, they can still do that themselves, but they can park some of their money in this bond sleeve. Is that is that accurate? Yeah. Uh, so look, there, there's a couple of caveats to this. And, and yes, you know, more than welcome. If, if somebody's interested in taking advantage of what we're doing with bonds and you know, we're happy to do it for you. Uh, a couple of caveats, though. Uh, we're buying individual bonds. So in, in these sleeves, there won't be any ETFs, really. We might use a couple of ETFs for tactical trading purposes, et cetera. But the majority of the portfolio will be individual bonds. Um, individual bonds, depending on what type of bonds we're buying, duration, uh, mortgage backs versus corporates, depending on the sleeve, um, there's different dollar amounts and, and liquidity issues with, with certain bonds. So 
uh, these portfolios have a hundred thousand dollar minimum. Now you can put as much as you want into it, but um, because of the breakdown of the allocation of the bond portfolio, getting enough uh, you know spread between bonds for diversification, uh, even in the treasury portfolio, if it's all treasuries, we want to break it out between one month, three months, six months, nine months, two years, ten years, right? Um, so it's got to have enough capital to make that kind of diversification. So just I would just want to put that caveat out there um, that so everybody knows. But yes, you can just open up an account and, you know, you can set up a, an address somewhere on Wealthion, say Wealthion slash fixed dash income or something like that. Uh, email me and say, hey, I'm interested in this portfolio. You can open up an account at Fidelity or Schwab and say that I just want all I want to do is just do this one sleeve and we can do that for you. All right, cool. So, 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 not for any everybody. There's a yeah. capital minimum because you have to have enough to do the strategies that you're deploying there. Um, you said you know you guys are buying individual bonds, and yeah, that's one of the questions I hear from people all the time. They're like, I don't even know how to how do you buy a bond, right? You know, they're familiar with the ETFs, uh, yeah. but most people do not know how to buy individual bonds, um, especially. Can, yeah. yeah, can I say something real quick? This is a really important point. Um, it, it's really easy to buy bonds. It's not hard. You can buy bonds. Just call your bond desk at whatever brokerage firm you have and say, I want to buy a bond for my account and they'll buy you one. It's, it's really fairly easy. The hard part is doing all the, the mathematics of it and really understanding what you're buying because there's a lot of moving parts to, to bonds. But the reason we're buying, this is the point I wanted to make, Adam. The, the reason that we're buying individual bonds in this sleeve in particular and not ETFs is because ETFs don't mature. So if for some right. reason we're completely wrong in our thesis, and interest rates go to 10%, right? The bond prices in that sleeve are going to decline. But because we own the individual bonds, they will mature at face value. So there's no principal risk in the treasury bond portfolio, as an example, right? Because the government will make good on their bond. If it's a Ginnie Mae, you know, Fannie Mae portfolio, the government will make good on those bonds. So interest rate risk is somewhat extracted, other than just intermediate volatility in prices out of that bond portfolio. And that's why we want to own individual bonds. So it, it provides safety of capital as well as return potential over time, uh, unlike an ETF. So that's the only reason that we don't use ETFs for this particular structure. Got it, got it. I'm really glad you made that distinction. Um, very important point. Um, again, goes back to why you want somebody buying the you know <laughs> these individual bonds, figuring the right basket for them, um, but coming up with a strategy. And, and that that's what I think is, I think so interesting about this potential opportunity in time is the, the downside appears to be no guarantee in life, but it appears to be fairly limited here because of what you're saying, Lance, you can always hold them to maturity, get your principal back and get paid the coupon, you know, in the time, in the interim time being. Um, all right, great. Well, look, I, I, I don't want to flog this over flog this, but we've just had a lot of people asking us about this. And I was super excited when you told me that the team building this. So again, just to review, um, ex exposure to bonds with the guidance of a highly experienced bond trading financial advisor. Um, it's got a minimum, so it's not for everybody, but it's also, it's not an all or nothing type thing, meaning if you want to keep the majority of your money at your existing advisor or do it yourself and just put money in the sleeve as part of your portfolio, seems like that's totally doable too. So all I'll say, folks, is if you want to learn more about this, um, I'll do this after we're done here, Lance. But if you go to wealthion.com slash fixed income, uh, then uh, and I'll put up a link on the screen here to that. Um, you can reach out to Lance's firm to learn more about this. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to do it. Okay, great. All right. So um, now after that little detour, but a very important one. Um, so <laughs> you, you talked about, I just want to get back to our conversation about equities for a second, because um, like you said, you don't think the risk return ratio is looking great on them next year. I mentioned earlier, they might be setting themselves for up for disappointment here. Um, it, it was amazing to me when Powell made that comment that triggered the markets. It was near the end of the trading day. I think there was like an hour, like maybe an hour and 15 minutes left of trading. And the S&P went up over 3.1%, like you said. The NASDAQ was up like almost 5%, right? So um, one, that is not a, a sign of... Um, uh, you know, healthy. He healthy markets that are efficiently <laughs> yeah. priced, right? right. Uh, secondly, it probably is a sign of a bunch of folks getting squeezed. So I'd love for you to shorts getting squeezed. So I'd love for you to comment on what role you think that that might have played here. But also, you know, if indeed lower prices are ahead and we are still in a bear market, um, you have done a good job of reminding us that bear markets are punctuated 
by these kind of rallies out of the blue like this, would this be sort of a classic one like that? Oh, yeah. Uh, so first of all, you know, it's interesting. So remember, I have to get my date straight now. So this Wednesday, we had Jerome Powell's speech. Last Wednesday was the CPI report, right? And where the market was up right. five and a half. The, so the S&P was up five and a half percent on that day. And then we flip-flopped around for a week. And then now we're up 3.1% 3, 3 on this. So we got less bang for the buck out of Powell's speech than we got out of the CPI. Um, but the most shorted stocks were the ones that were driving the rally. Right. So uh, to your point, it was a lot of short squeeze, people getting forced out of positions. And then once you cross the 200 day moving average, and that was really if you take a look at the trading on Wednesday, um, Powell spoke and the market moved up about 40 points. Right. And so I was talking to Mike at the time on the phone. I was like, hey, well, this is what he said. What do you think? Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, you really, we're not getting that big of a response right here from, from this. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a little surprised from, from the speech that we're not getting a bigger move. And then the market kind of muddled around for a few minutes and then kind of moved, started moving up. And as soon as you cross that 200-day moving average, the market took off. And that was because all those algorithms that have been watching that 200-day moving average. So as soon as stocks crossed that level, it turned on all those buy programs. And so shorts had to get covered. Stocks were getting bought. It was a very heavy volume day, uh, in particular on that day. Um, but a lot of that, again, all short squeeze, you know, algorithmic trading, et cetera, just kind of forcing money. Interestingly enough, large cap ETFs actually had $8 billion worth of, of on when. So, what, sorry, you, 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 you glitched there briefly, Lance. Right. Um, those large cap funds had what? Uh, no, uh, on Wednesday, what was interesting about that is, is that while the market was moving up, there was actually $8 billion worth of outflows in large cap equity ETFs. So one thing, was, what was also interesting is because bonds were moving up very sharply as well. So money was flowing out of equity ETFs into bond ETFs and individual stocks were moving higher. So it, it was interesting that we are seeing a rotation of flows in ETFs, as you're starting to see, you know, these algorithmic trading kind of picking up over the, as you kind of broke that 200, level, that 200 day moving average. So, you know, again, you know, this is typical bear market behavior. And so be careful chasing this year. There's possibly some upside. You know, our target for the end of this year is 41, 4,200. I still think that's a, a real possibility. Um, we've still got uh, year end window dressing for portfolios next week or so. Uh, We've got mutual fund rebalancing, so it might be a little bit sloppy, but you get your year end window dressing for mutual funds, hedge funds, pension funds, et cetera. And then first five days of January, you have a lot of inflows coming into the market. And also adding to all this is five billion a day in corporate share repurchases. So that's also pushing market prices. Um, but first five days of January, you have a lot of inflows coming in, 401k plan contributions by companies. 529, SEPs, all this type of stuff. Uh, you have more money flows in January than the other 11 months combined. So there's a, a potential we could see a bit of a rally into the first part of, of 2023. But that's where, again, our, our, our kind of our underlying thesis is you're going to see the impact of all these rate hikes. Slower economic growth means slower earnings, which means lower valuations. And, and so stocks may finish out next year on a positive note, but it probably won't be substantially higher. Okay. Um, yeah, interesting. And, and it seems, as we've talked about many times in this program, uh, capital flows are such a, a huge factor still in terms of pushing around stock prices, or at least the prices of the major indices, because of all those the passive investment vehicles out there that just take that money and feed it to you know, dependable parts of the, of the market. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously yeah. it, it, I'll let you respond, but just real okay. quick in, in, in um, hit, you know, experiencing the impact of those, the delayed impact of the rate hikes that have happened so far, as you've been just mentioning um, that should actually, you know, begin to filter through in terms of companies that can afford to pay workers less, lay people off, stuff like that. So perhaps the buying surge this January might be lower than what we've seen in some past years because things are getting yeah. drained now. Yeah, no, I, I look, I'm just simply looking at historical statistics. Look, my job is to measure possibilities and probabilities, right? That's, that's all I do every day when we're managing money. 
So is it again, here, here's the big debate in our shop right now. Is it possible we cannot have a recession this year? That's the big debate, right? Sure, it's possible. Probable, probably not, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many indicators suggesting that we're gonna have a recession, but as I've said here before, everybody's expecting one, which means usually something else happens. So maybe it gets delayed for some reason until 2024. I don't know. But the big debate is possibilities versus probabilities. You know, and, and this is the one thing you know, we're going to be fighting consistently going into next year is as these rate hikes come through, you know, things are going to be very different. And, and a lot of historical precedent is going to get thrown out the window. I have a feeling just, you know, just like we were talking about with Tom Lee and the 50 percent retracement of the Fibonacci, you know, back in June. Never before has that led to new lows. And we went to new lows. Right. This time is right. different. Um, so so next year, I think we could be talking about a lot of things that don't hold up to historical statistics. But those are the possibilities that, that can occur, and we want to be aware uh, of those things. Now, one thing I was going to say when you were talking about this is that when we're talking about next year, and I said, look, you know, markets could be positive next year. There's a lot of statistics out right now that say, you know, in a year that finishes negative, the next year is always positive right. by some percentage amount. You know, this is the problem with the way that we actually view our portfolios as well, because we reset everything to zero starting in January. January 1st, zero. I haven't lost any money this year. OK, completely forgot that I'm down 15 percent for last year or whatever it was. Right. I'm zero now. So I've not lost any money in January. So if the market finishes up next year, 10 percent, everybody's going to go, see, every down year leads to an up year. You're right. still negative over a two year period. Right. 10 percent didn't get you back to where you were at the beginning of January of 2022, right? So it's important. This is why we're talking about, you know, psychologically, the worst thing you can do for your portfolio and for your own management is to benchmark yourself from, from January 1st to December 31st. Look at your portfolio over a period of two or three years, and that'll help you make much better decisions about where you're putting money, how you're allocating money, because you're not panicking over, oh my God, I'm down 10% this year. We're down 15% this year. We're still above where we were at the peak of the market in 2019. You still have a positive return in your portfolio. Despite all the crap this year, you still have a positive rate of return in your portfolio over the last couple of years. This is also what the Fed looks at too, in terms of the wealth effect. You know, so, so again, it, but when you start looking at your portfolio over longer time periods, you go, look, okay, I know I'm down this year, but before I panic and go sell everything, go to cash, buy gold and beanie weenies, Let's keep a perspective on how am I progressing towards my financial goal? Yes, I'm down a little bit this year. What do I need to do for next year to improve my returns? Remember, as we always say here, you know, uh, investing is like a game of football, game of inches, right? Make small changes, makes big results down the road. All right. Very well said, Lance. And, and you're doing what I love uh, to have you on this program to do, which is to just, you know, be that constant reminder of what an experienced seasoned financial advisor recommends and how they think, because people are, you know, we're, we're, we're human animals, you know, we, our emotions take control and, and we kind of forget everything and we just, we just move. And oftentimes that makes us do the wrong thing at the wrong time. This is, isn't the exact same type of math, but it's a near enough analogy that I just want to mention it, which is, um, humans are, are generally bad risk assessors, and that's a whole other topic in and of itself. But to the point you're making, you know, if I take a quarter out and I flip it, right? If I say I'm going to flip this coin, Lance, you know, what are the odds it's going to come up heads? Um, you'll say correctly, the odds are 50%, right? Um, <clears throat> but what you have to take into account to what you're saying is, is you have to take the context into account. If I flip this coin, uh, you know, seven times in a row, yes, the odds of that one single flip uh, are going to be 50-50. But if I ask myself, what are the odds of having flipped a coin heads seven times in a row? I haven't done the math, but they're super low, right? <laughs> and so um, to your point about sort of looking at the market every time from, you know, an artificial start like Jan 1, you're ignoring the prior context, right? So you could be expecting a much higher... Uh, you could be expecting a much lower probability event to occur than really is merited given the history, right? Yeah, I tell you what, if you have some time, there's a, a movie on, I believe it's Amazon Prime, as it's called Larry and Marge Go Large. Yeah, Brian yeah. Cranston, right? With Brian Cranston. 
If you haven't seen it, it's kind of it's it's kind of almost like a Hallmark movie. So you kind of got to just get past that little sweet tooth part of it. But it's it's actually based on a true story about a guy who works in the factory plant and he starts playing the lottery, but he's a math whiz and nobody gives him credit for being so smart math wise. But he figures out that there's a hole in the lottery and he figures out how to take advantage of it. And it's all based on binomial distributions and other things that he looks at. But what he figures out, and to your point, right, he even makes this comment to uh, the teller at a bank in the movie. He says, look, he says, take this penny. If I flip it a thousand times, I may get 60% heads, right, just because of the way it works out. But if I increase the magnitude of the flips, that that distribution of returns is going to move closer and closer to 50-50. And, th and this is what he figures out with how to win the lottery. He's got to keep betting bigger and bigger to win the lottery every single time. And it's all based on the hole that's in the mathematics of the lottery that, that they put together. It's a really fascinating movie. If you like that kind of quirky movie, uh, like I do, because I love that kind of stuff, um, it's, 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 it's interesting to watch, but he uses all the proceeds to rebuild his town and, and all kinds of stuff. Again, it's a, it's a bit of a Hallmark movie. And then there's the evil Harvard kids that are figured out the same hole and he's got to knock them down, right? So it, it's got some nice twists to it. But the important thing is it's about the odds, right? And, and understanding what the distribution of possibilities and probabilities are. And, and again, to, to, to your exact you know, uh, example of flipping a coin, this is a really good example. This movie, if you watch, it's a really good example of exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, and it's about the power of understanding the odds, which yeah. most people aren't good at. But if you can, you give yourself a great advantage. And by being bad at it, you actually put yourself at a pretty big disadvantage. I was, I was laughing when you were telling that story because I was just thinking about, I was imagining the folks at Netflix tonight saying, why the heck are we seeing such a huge spike in this Larry and Marge go hard? <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, I apologize. This is an Amazon, didn't I? Yeah, it is on Netflix. Yeah, oh, I don't know whatever one it's on, but but my point is, is I think a lot of people watching who you just gave them their Saturday night, you know, watch material. Uh, and so they're going to be a, a, an abnormal spike in views on it. Um, okay, hold on. Hold, hold on. I'm just checking. Yes, it is Amazon Prime. Okay, Amazon Prime. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, one quick thing about this, too, which is interesting, is the the field of statistics, which really is the realm of what we're talking about here, Lance, um, probabilities and all the math that goes into it. It all started with people trying to understand gambling this yep. centuries ago, but you know, trying to understand games of chance, craps, cards, et cetera, um, which is pretty funny. It's almost sort of you know akin to how so much of the internet technological revolution was driven by people wanting to see you know naked pictures of each other you know, on the internet. Um, <laughs> so much of what we understand about probability comes from people wanting to win in games of chance. Exactly. Um, all right. Uh, I'd love to talk more about that, but you said you were keeping me on a schedule here, so I got to keep going. Um, you mentioned jobs earlier, and I think we should talk briefly about the data. Um, it's been an interesting data for week for jobs because we had the ADP report. We had the JOLTS report, both of which I think were actually fairly disappointing. Yeah. Um, and there was a lot of discussion of like, hey, is this the lipsticks now off the pig, right? We're, we're through the midterm elections. They don't need to fluff everything up anymore. Um, but then we got uh, the payrolls today. And as you, you mentioned, um, they still look pretty darn good. And uh, we have this crazy gap you mentioned. I'll put a, a picture of it here up on the screen of the gap between the household survey and the establishment survey with the establishment being something now like 2.7 million uh, right. jobs uh, higher than the household. And we've talked a lot about the, the differences in methodology, so we won't have to rehash all that here. But you've been saying that you expect to see a whopper of a, uh, of a correction to this material at some point. And my guess is you expect that correction to be downward. Yeah, yeah, you know, I just, well, you know, Again, we go back to why is the Fed hiking rates? And, and again, you know, it's interesting, right? Because they, they've talked about this. They said, look, we're going to hike rates until we get inflation under control. And that is going to require unemployment to go up to four and a half percent. I mean, they've been very clear about this already. You know, it's almost like that old saying, right? The beatings are going to continue until morale improves. Right, right. So, this is the Fed. Um, and they keep saying this, but it, apparently the markets don't listen to this. Um, you know, but again, I, again, is it possible that 
we get into next year and employment hangs tough, consumption continues, people just keep running up credit cards and the economy just kind of slides down to half a percent growth and avoids a recession. Sure, it's possible. I don't see how we do that when we look at all the other factors that are out there, what's happening with manufacturing and, and other stuff. And that was one of the interesting points. So you and I have been talking a bit lately about the tech job layoffs. And we've seen a lot of technology jobs being laid off. And, and that's understandable. Although a lot of those excess jobs were created, those are just kind of coming off. They're kind of getting back to normal labor for, for their businesses. But in the ADP report, we saw 100,000 manufacturing jobs, starting to see it actually come into the rest of the economy right. now, uh, coming out. So I, I think it's just a lag effect. And again, you know, the establishment survey and the household survey, the, the establishment survey comes from the household survey. It's just all the manipulations and adjustments and everything else that gets us to the establishment survey. Um, I just have a feeling that's going to play catch up next year and yeah, we'll see yeah, some it, fairly it, decent it, negative revisions. It, it, sorry to interrupt you, but the article just came out uh, like an hour ago saying that uh, of the jobs that have been reported in the survey, um, like a third of them, I think, are, are, are due to Excel model assumptions. Yes. Right. So there is a oh. lot of, you know, guesswork in there that that may need to be cleaned up. Yeah, well, there's, you know, there's this uh, anomalous birth death adjustment, right? right, which we've talked about before. And every month that adds a couple hundred thousand jobs every month. And what that says is that every month somebody's creating a business and at least hiring themselves, right? So, uh, but if we actually take a look at the number of businesses that have been created since 2009, there is no evidence created businesses and creating all these jobs in the businesses because the number of businesses haven't grown. So I, I was just talking about this with um, Mike Mish Shedlock uh, yesterday on a Twitter space, and he's actually called up the BLS and he's talked to these people and he says, you know, what? they're not they're not bad people. They're, they're pretty smart, actually. Um, and he says he they understand the criticism against them. And it's not that they wouldn't want to be running the numbers more you know, accurately. So the problem is, is they can't get access to some of the data they want. And, and an example he used was <coughs> yeah, for this birth death thing. Well, no, he said for this birth birth death thing, um, you know, it'd be super easy if you just matched up social security numbers, right? Mm -hmm. And you could just get rid of all the duplicates. But he said these guys can't apparently can't get access to the social security numbers because apparently it's not, um, you know, encrypted or whatever. And they've just sort of been told sorry, guys, you can't get it. And that's why they have to do all these crazy assumptions yeah. now. Okay. So first of all, let's just blow some holes through that real quick. Maybe, but but whatever the answer is, I, I pretty much assume we can put it under the category of that's government for you. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, look, there's plenty of real time. Look, this is the thing that frustrates me about the employment data. Okay. So first of all, the establishment survey, it's a phone call survey. They call the same households for six months, and it's like 60,000 households for six months. And they say, Adam, are you working? You go, yeah, I'm working. Great. He's employed. Um, and then they call you for six months and they move on to a different household. So it's a survey. And then they take that survey and here's all of our statistics, right? We then extrapolate that survey out to represent the whole of the economy. So that's right. how we get to this, this survey. We have actual data, ADP paychecks. We have payroll companies that would share that information with the government. How ADP, how many people last month became full-time employees at a corporation? 400,000. Great. Okay. How many employees got fired last month? They know this data. There's because people either get added to the ADP payroll software or they get terminated from the software. There's no guesswork to right. any of this. So we had, so this is all <laughs> bullshit. Uh, data <laughs> and access is, is clearly not true. Again, now you take ADP, which is millions of people. You take paychecks, which is millions of people. Plus you could probably get three or four more payroll companies out there that may be smaller. Accumulate that data. And now you're not, you're not extrapolating 60,000 people into the economy. You're extrapolating millions of people to look at the actual employment of the country. This is not complicated. No. Um, so I'm going to go back to my earlier point. I think now, that, that's, that's our rant for the day, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, look, so um, kind of last last point on jobs, which is just um, despite today's 
still still rosy numbers on unemployment. Um, I think you and I are both skeptical um, of the direction of unemployment. Um, and, and I, I want to connect a couple of dots here. First, I just want to say, I believe that that Jerome Powell is, um, let me put it this way. If he's looking to tighten conditions, um, a higher, or sorry, a, a, a rosy, rosier than believable jobs number helps him, right? Because he can yeah. say there's no problems in the em employment space. And then if the market's throwing a party like it is right now, right, which is loosening financial conditions, um, that just makes him have to lean even further into what he's doing, right? So it's almost kind of like enjoy the party while it lasts, folks, because <laughs> you're making the parents even angrier when they come back in through the door, right? So um, th th there's that. Um, and then uh, one thing just real quick to mention, uh, you know, you and I have been talking about, you know, we've been tracking GDP. It was negative the first two quarters. It was pretty, pretty big number in, in Q3 and Q4 started with an even bigger number, right? Uh, that's a live model that gets adjusted as new data comes in throughout the quarter. And that just experienced a really big drop since last week, right? It was, I think it was at 4.3% last week. Yep. It's now down to 28 Yep. Right. So, and, that, and, that's uh, not, and that's not surprising. Uh, you know, the, you know, the Atlanta Fed, they use they kind of start out the month on an estimate and then they start collecting real time data. And so initially they had some good data that popped the GDP number up. But, you know, as we get further into the quarter, you know, they're getting real time data now. Right. Employment, retail sales, retail sales weren't great. You know, while you know, while ADP came out, uh, sorry, not ADP, I apologize. Uh, while Adobe came out and was talking about nine point two billion dollars. It's a record, right, for retail sales for Thanksgiving. That wasn't inflation adjusted, right? You actually lost retail sales by about 5.7 percent because after inflation. Factor inflation. So, you know, all that stuff, so, so it's real-time data is feeding into the Atlanta Fed. I want, you know, again, look, I expect a positive uh, fourth quarter GDP. Uh, we have two point, uh, the, the second estimate of the third quarter was 2.6 percent, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, and you may have that number in front of you. I don't. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see two and a half to three percent for the fourth quarter. Wouldn't surprise me at all. A little bit less would, wouldn't surprise me either. But I think we do get two quarters of positive GDP growth. I think the real risk of negative economic growth and the risk of recession is probably second, third and fourth quarter somewhere in there. It could be like third and fourth quarter or second, third quarter of 2023. Okay. And, and as we sort of leave the financial markets part of the discussion here, um, that's what I wanted to dig into a little bit with you, because I wanted to get your reaction to this article that was written just a couple of days ago by a smart guy named Lance Roberts titled, The Next Secular Bear Market May Be Upon Us. Yeah. Um, so I was curious if there's anything that we haven't already sort of scavenged from that report already in our discussion that you want to flag for folks. Yeah, no. So it's a. I think it's an interesting article because you know two things. One, and and I always know when I write an article because I get a call from Business Insider. So when it's kind of <laughs> something super bearish for them to to, to call me, right? So, uh, but they they call me today. You know, wanting to talk about this article. You know, so a couple of important takeaways about this is that you know valuations are a terrible market timing device, right? So. You know, valuations are still elevated. There was a, uh, an interesting chart. I believe it was in the Daily Shot today, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can find it for you uh, again. But what it showed is, is the Cape valuation and, and, and basically one standard deviation of valuations above the 20-year average, right? And, and so we're one standard deviation. We're at the fourth highest level of valuations in history, even with the decline in valuations this year. So yeah. valuations, we're still the fourth highest level on record. Well, so what valuations tell you is that going forward, you're going to have lower rates of return. Now, that doesn't mean that every, and this was the question I got from business insiders, like, well, Lance, what you're saying is, is that investors should just stay out of the stock market because they're only going to get 3% a year or 2% a year on the stock market, I'm like, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is, is that when you look back over a 10 year period, your returns are gonna be two, 3%. That means there's right, gonna be right. some excellent bull markets in the end that we can trade and make money. And then you're gonna have a year like now, right? Where you're down 15% for the year. And that lowers that long-term return. So let me just jump in on this because this is a really important point for folks to understand for why I do what I do here at Wealthion by bringing guys like you in. 
which is so John Hussman has had a series of charts that we've we've shown very frequently on this program that similarly, you know, look at at uh, the data and say, hey, projected returns for the next 12 years are negative. I haven't looked at his, his chart relatively recently. I'll try and see if I can find it. I'll put it up here. But, um, uh, you know, basically says, hey, you know, based on history, it's telling us that we may have kind of a lost decade ahead of us, right, in terms of market returns from today, right, right. to your point, which is, it doesn't mean the market's just going to sit and be a flat line for the next 12 years. It's going to go all over the place. And that is an environment where you want to have a good active manager. Because if you take the passive approach, well, you're pretty much signing up for that lost decade, right? That's the big difference of the time that we've been in, which was a bonanza for passive models. And we're now entering into a, an era where I think to really get any gain, uh, you're going to have to really have a good active uh you know, strategy and therefore a good coach. Yeah, no, look, I, I wrote an article previously. I, I just put that massive fat softball on the T-ball for you here, Lance. So knock it out of the park, okay? <laughs> yeah, no, I wrote an article uh, not too long ago talking about how we've had 12% annualized returns over the last decade. Um, and that was four full percentage points above the average rate of return from 1900 to 2008, right? So 108 years you know, of returns at 8%. And then from 2009 to 2020, we did 12% a year. And that was because of all this monetary stimulus that we've been injecting into the markets. And that's 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 unsustainable long-term. And, and now the Fed's trying to extract that liquidity, which automatically guarantees you lower rates of return. And so, you know, but again, where did this passive indexing boom generate from? 2008 to present, cranking out 12% a year. Why not just buy an S&P index fund, make 12% a year? Hell, who wouldn't do that, right? So the problem, to your point going forward, is that I think over the next decade, we could see people actually turning away from ETFs going, I'm not getting what I need from this because right. market is just all over the place. I really, you know, I'm going to go back to being, and look, I think this could, pretend, I'm not saying this is absolutely going to be the case, don't get me wrong. But, you know, I think there's going to be a potential opportunity here for good stock pickers to really separate themselves out from the crowd and generate returns over the next 10 years in a more volatile market. All right. So I'm going to underscore one last thing before we move off this, which is your point, good stock pickers, right? So we have talked enough on this program. I think most people have heard this before, which is we have been in, in easy mode yeah. for much of the past 15 years. Right, where you just close your eyes, throw a dart, hit a stock ticker, go buy it. It's going to do well because there's just been this massive rising tide, right? Because of all the QE, all the intervention, the the disinflationary trends of lower interest rates and globalization and all that stuff. And all those things I just mentioned are over, at least for the time being, right? Um, yeah. So it's a totally different world. So the the broker, the stock picker, the financial analyst. All their muscles that they've developed at this point in their career are for easy mode, right? Yeah. You need somebody who actually has the muscle and the musculature and the expertise for hard mode, or at least you know much more volatile mode. Um, so again, folks, you know the mission of this channel is to help you make wealth, uh, help you build wealth. Uh, we think for most people, you do that um, in combination, you know, in partnership with a really good financial advisor. Um, and that, that's what I'm just trying to underscore here. Make sure they're a really good one. Make sure they're one that has experience with these other markets. And I'm not trying to slam younger uh, players out there, but if 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 you've got a younger broker, um, you want to make sure that they're at least getting you know a that they take these these macro considerations we're talking about um, into account, but also too that they hopefully have you know somebody with some gray hair advising them um, who remembers some of the rougher markets back in the you know 70s, 80s, et cetera. Um, so anyways, uh, I'll get off my soapbox on that right now, but it's just, it, it's, it's so important. I think for most people to realize that most financial advisors in the business right now don't have any experience investing in an inflationary environment and don't have any experience investing in this sort of lost decade, like we're talking about. Look, I mean, and, and look, the, the, the whole model is not designed for that. And, you know, and, and, you know, look, I get it. You know, people have a bad taste in their mouth about financial advisors. They've had them. They were put into, you know, kind of these cookie cutter, 
you know, models and just kind of buy and hold. Don't worry about the ups and the downs. It's all fine. It always goes up over time. That was a story we were told. And, you know, interestingly enough, if, if you, you know, people that were in the markets in 1998 were told that by 2003, they were out of the market. They were told that in 2005, six and seven, by 2009, they were out of the market. You know, and these, and so people in the markets today, a lot of them in the markets today, and particularly with financial advisors as well, They've never seen a real bear market. This is this is we're not even in a real bear market right right now, right? Markets are down this year, but this isn't a bear market. When you're in a bear market, you're going to really know it because nobody's going to want to own anything. You won't see people trying to time market bottoms in a bear market. So this does not have the hallmark of a bear market yet, right? So I'll put that little caveat in there. But most of these big wirehouses, right? Merrill Lynch, Bank of America, you know, they're the same people, uh, JP Morgan, Wells Fargo. They all, you know, basically all their advisors are trained, bring the client in, put them in this model, move them off to the side, go hire me, go find me a new client, right? So it's just all these kind of buy and hold passive indexing models. And, and this has really become the standard in the industry. And that's, and, and, that's not financial advising. That's not being a financial advisor, just sticking somebody to buy. You can do that yourself at Vanguard. Just go buy some ETFs and sit on them. Um, but I think because, and again, just you know, looking at statistics and probabilities over the next decade, I don't think that model works nearly as good as it did in the last 10 years. I think it's really true. Okay, well, look, enough beating that horse. Hopefully folks have gotten the message. Um, so let's let's go to housing before we begin our wrap up here. Um, uh, housing just, you know, crapped. To, to, to your point, yeah, the beatings are going to continue until morale improves. Um, I just was looking at a chart of pending home sales. Um, pending home sales have just fallen off a cliff, um, and uh, they're now at the you know, kind of in the territory they were back when we shut the economy down and people literally couldn't leave their homes to go, you know, to open houses and buy houses. Um, so, uh, again, this is all part of that sort of stalemate that you and I were talking about that old wild west, you know, high noon shootout between sellers and buyers, sellers don't want to bring their prices down. Buyers are balking at these prices. Um, mortgage rates have come down slightly. And interestingly, I, I just talked with a guy yesterday who said he's, he's seeing some a slight renewed surge of activity in his business, which he said just basically went in the, you know, freeze mode, uh, around March of this year. Um, so, you know, maybe there's a couple of pent up transactions that just had to have to happen that are getting made here, but man, it, it, unless we see home, uh, mortgages coming down materially in the next couple quarters, which I just don't feel free to contradict me if you do, but I just, I can't see that happening. Um, I, I think the continued rollover that we're beginning to see in more and more markets is going to happen. And before I let you have the baton here, Lance, um, I had Wolf Richter on the program a week, week and a half ago talking about the housing market. He just published some new charts on kind of the the, the most, the, the hottest, um, highest activity, U.S. metros. Um, and it is, it is really clear now. You can really see the peak now. You know, we're, we're still probably only, you know, in inning, end to inning one, beginning inning two, it looks like from the charts of where the correction could go. But you can see that the peak is now clearly behind us in virtually all of the hot markets west of the Mississippi. East Coast looks like we're beyond peak two, but it's still close-ish to the top where you could get a last hurrah. Uh, but clearly in a lot of the hottest markets, um, the, the rollover is in process. Yeah, no, and, and look, you know, you could even theoretically get lower interest rates and not have a pickup in the housing market. And this would be akin to what we saw in 2008. I'm not saying we're going to have a financial crisis. I'm not saying that. But what I mean is, is that when you get into an economic recession uh, or an economic downturn or a real economic slowdown, however you want to classify it, um, people are going to be losing their jobs and are worried about their jobs and are not going to want to commit to buying a new mortgage, even if interest rates are lower. So. Right. Interest rates could come down and we still see housing activity fall because of what's happening in the economy. That would not be surprising. And I, I, I kind of really expect that to happen. You know, it is interesting, um, you know, because, as you know, we sold our house back in June. Um, we've been renting since then. And we're watching the housing market here because we want to buy and we, you know, we, we want to buy a house eventually. We don't want to rent forever. And it is interesting right now because 
we're seeing, so, like my wife just showed me a house today, really nice house. I mean, exactly. Like if we were going to buy a house today, this would be the house we would buy. Right? Just, it's all been redone. It's all, you know, been fixed up. It's exactly our taste. Um, but there's some houses like that that are still turning. Like they come to market, they've got an offer on them in three or four days. So that still is occurring if the house is priced right. Houses like that are still moving. But, you know, I still think that to your point, that as we get a little bit further into this, that's going to start to slow. You know, right now, there's still kind of a little bit of a match between buyers and sellers. There's those last kind of hangers oners, But I think that's starting to get less and less as we move forward. All right. Yeah. And and it's interesting. Um, you know, this this is, as we've said, the way markets like this correct, particularly markets like housing, which are slower simply just because they're less liquid than most financial markets like stocks and bonds. Right, takes takes longer for things trends to ripple through the system. Um, uh, they tend to kind of weaken, 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 and then then they really just kind of dump. Yeah. Right, that's that's the way they generally work. Um, so one sort of sign of the times along this arc is there was a headline that came out yesterday for Blackstone, um, which is one of the really big institutional investors um, in real estate. Um, we've talked about kind of the what we, you and I, I think, think are sort of the evils of companies like Blackstone owning too much of the retail uh, housing stock, which I still maintain is a really big problem here. Um, but just on the commercial side alone, um, they have a couple of funds um, that are in the like you know hundreds of billions um, that uh, in, invest in commercial real estate that are now experiencing um, almost kind of like runs on the funds where they're having you know a ton of spooked investors. That are basically demanding redemptions, and yeah. Blackstone is now basically, um, you know, stopping withdrawals, right? Yeah. So it's same correct. thing with a bank, right? I mean, it's just it it, it doesn't mean that they are in a bad position from a solvency standpoint, but it's never a good sign when your investors are demanding so many redemptions that you basically have to stop them, right? Right. Well, and again, you know, the problem with these real estate funds is that there's no liquidity in them, right? So the only way I can make redemptions is I got to dump properties. Eventually, at some point, right? So they probably right. have enough, and, cash and that's flow. a danger you've never been talking about. Which is yeah. if it, if it gets to that point, you all of a sudden have a distressed seller of potentially many properties in an area that just says, "I got to let them go," right? And it brings everything down along with yeah. it. And that was my point: is that you know, right now everything's okay, but you know, everything's just kind of teetering along, and and we're kind of matching. Like I said, we're kind of matching buyers and sellers. If you get to the point that one of these major accumulators start dumping properties on the market, that's where it's going to get ugly pretty quick. Okay, great. And I'm not um, saying it's going to happen, but you know, just that's the risk. Yeah. Okay. So anyways, um, everybody, you know, we're, we're going to keep tracking the housing market as we see it from here. Uh, but certainly nothing's happening. That's changing my outlook. And I assume yours too, Lance, right. that housing um, has a, a bleak year ahead of it. Yeah. yeah, you know, and and look, you know, housing stocks like D. H. Horton and Beezer Homes, you know, they're they're holding up well this year relative to the market. Um, but I think there's some more downside risk in those. But I think those are going to be some great value buys once we get into next year. But but again, it's really going to depend on how this housing market ultimately turns out. And I don't have a crystal ball. Um, but I, I again, kind of like with the economy, how do we avoid a much bigger downturn in housing? I don't know. Is it possible? Sure. Right. But it certainly seems like with higher interest rates, slower, weaker environment, et cetera, that that kind of that kind of slowdown is inevitable. Yeah, yeah. But you know, our job is to parse possible from probable, right? When Tom Brady finally retires from the Buccaneers, it's possible they might call me and ask me to take his slot. Not very probable. <laughs> and it's also it's also possible he may never retire at this point. So yeah, I know. He may outlast all of us. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So one thing I just want to quickly note is, um, well, for, first, say anything you like about the dollar uh, that might be material. Um, but I, I do want to note that the precious metals have actually had a pretty good run. Gold is back up above $1,800 an ounce. It was down in the 1600s, you know, not all that long ago. Silver is up by a third since yep. September 1st. I just ran the numbers this morning. Um, so we're seeing that really spark to life. Um, I imagine a lot of that is due to the dollar retreating here, but anything about either of those two dollar precious metals that you think are worth noting? 
Yeah, no, uh, first of all, finally, Precious Metals got a little bit of love. Thank God. I mean, it's just been, you know, not been working this year at all. You know, so the, the whole, you know, buy gold for inflation, it's a hedge that hasn't worked. Um, finally, you know, people are getting their money back. I suspect that, you know, gold is uh, like the market has probably much made most of its run here. And you're going to have a lot of people that are trapped in the metal that are going to want to get out. So they bought it earlier this year, expecting this whole big return on it. It didn't occur. They're underwater. So you have these big rallies, you expect some selling here. So if you're, if you're along the metal, you may want to take some profits, wait for a pullback. If you want to buy some more, that would probably be a, a good way to approach it. Watch the dollar. Um, now, this is the interesting thing about the dollar versus metals. Normally, normally you, a weaker dollar is better for metals. And but, you know, this year, because we saw what's been going on with the dollar, this collapse in the dollar has led to a big spark in metals. That's been great. Um, you know, the dollar also now is oversold. So, again, kind of going back to this idea of, of maybe taking some profits in your positions for a little bit, raise a little bit of cash, uh, look for a better opportunity. I think we're going to get a, a counter trend rally in the dollar. I do think the dollar is going lower next year. And for a whole variety of reasons. And one, particularly if we do get in a recession, that'll be a weaker dollar. That should bode better for precious metals as we go in next year. Look, metals love, uh, in particular, recessions, economic distress, those type of things, because it's a safe haven. Right. Belief, right. So, um, yeah, you know, so again, but again, it's a commodity, has no dividend. So trade it like a commodity. It's, it's had a nice run. Take a little bit of profit. Don't That doesn't mean sell everything, people. Take a little bit off the table. <laughs> and then you get a pullback. Add some more money back into it for the next trade higher. All right. Um, so because it's end of the year, um, we have talked on this program about the wisdom of uh, uh, tax loss harvesting. Yep. So I want to combine a couple of things we've talked about here. Um, you, you said, hey, you know, use this rally as a way to sort of lighten up, right? Because there are potentials that it could roll back over a bit and, you know, you want to protect your gains. Um, at the same time, um, we've also said you want to claim losses now here, right, to reduce uh, your taxable, uh, you know, offset any gains. Um, so I, I have had people reach out to me recently who said, hey, I, I, I had some pretty bad losses, but now we're rallying in the market here. What should I do? Should I should I ride this further um, to a, maybe maybe make up some of my losses, but also to try to strive for a long term, you know, capital gain status? Um, or is it better just to to sell now, put the assets somewhere else, and lock in those those end of year capital losses? Do you have a strong opinion one way or the other? Yeah, absolutely. This is the trap, right? So uh, you get into a capital loss situation. So finally, the market rallies and your position comes back to break even. You're like, yes, I'm back to break even. Now, when you were losing thirty or forty percent of your money, you told yourself that if you got back to break even, you'd sell the position. But when you get back to break even, now you're going, hey, but it could go higher. And then the thing rolls over, you go back down, now you're at 30, 40% loss again because that's the way it works. Um, no, um, this is the psychological trap that we repeatedly get ourselves into uh, in managing money and why we make poor decisions over time. If you have a tax loss situation, take the loss now. Again, you can turn right around. Let's say that you own ABC stock and you're down 30% in it and it's come back. So now you're only down 20% in it and it's overbought short term. Fine, sell it, take the 20% loss. In 31 days, you can buy ABC back again. And if it keeps going up, you're going to make some money on the position. You're going to sell that position in the future for a gain, offset your loss. So look, there's, there's no harm, no foul in selling something, even if it's starting to come back, right? Because again, you can use those losses. But what it does is it gets that stuff off of your portfolio. So you're not focusing and concentrating on that. You can look at the portfolio as a whole and say, what's my portfolio doing as a whole? Is it working like it's supposed to? And am I, am I taking the best opportunity for my money to grow? What happens is by holding on to these loser positions, hoping you're going to get back to even, is you wind up with a whole portfolio of losers waiting to get back to even rather than making your money work and grow over time. So that's, you know, so, so again, take advantage of the opportunity. This is end of the year. Do that. There's some, there's several things you should be thinking about end of the year right now. Um, and this is something my, my partners, uh, Richard Ross and Danny Ratliff are fantastic in, but if you're a high net worth investor, tax loss harvesting going into the end of the year, 
it gives you the ability to offset some losses against your gains in this year or in future years. Donor advised funds. This is a great opportunity. If you like to do charitable giving, this is a great opportunity to do some charitable giving that you control in a donor advised fund. Those can be set up at Fidelity, Schwab, other places, and it gives you ability to, to make some charitable donations through your portfolio, get that tax deduction going forward. Another thing is, is, is gifting stock. So let's say that you've got a stock that's down sharply this year and you can gift that stock to your church. So let's say that you're an individual that normally ties 10% of your income to your church. Well, instead of just pulling that cash out of your pocket and sticking it into the church coffers, nothing wrong with that, but it's hard to track it for IRS purposes that you tie to the church this much money. You know, give stock to the church. They'll dispose of it. They'll use the proceeds, but you get the tax deduction for it for a charitable donation. So that's another way to tie to your church or charity is gifting stock. But there's some great opportunities between now and the end of the year to help ease your tax burden next year. And, and again, you know, that's that's not my specialty. That's what Danny and Rich do really well. But those are things to be thinking about. Those are all great things. Uh, I'm really glad you mentioned them, Lance. And folks, um, if you haven't watched it, we had uh, Danny and Richard do a phenomenal uh, free webinar for us on retirement planning. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, just go to wealthion.com slash retirement planning, and you can watch it there for free, but it'll really give you a good overview of who these guys are as well and their 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 expertise. Um, so Lance, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll close as I always do telling people how they can go schedule one of the free consultations with RIA, but obviously if folks here are watching, you know, wanted to talk to your team about some of the things you just mentioned and how those strategies might be relevant for them, obviously that's something your team does all yeah. day long, right? Yeah. And again, so if you, and then I'll do a shameless plug here, but if you go to our website, realinvestmentadvice.com, there's a button right on the front page to ask a question. Uh, I, answer, I answer every email every day, but you can say, hey, I'm interested in donor advised funds or I'm interested in, um, you know, gifting stock. How do I do that? I'll put you in touch with Danny or Richard and they can walk us that you okay. setting up an advised fund is tricky, but they're very good at setting it up for you. All right. Well, I'm going to do an even more shameless plug for you and tell folks <laughs> to go to the Wealthion link because they can ask that those same questions. Yep. But if they want, they can have the free consultation where they can get like a, 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 a total tune-up, right? I mean, they can get the full experience, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. But just if, if you use that link uh, and you're in, a, in a specific to donor advised fund, just put in the comments, I'm interested in a donor advised fund or I'm interested in charitable gifting. So I know where to root it to. Great, great. And folks, there is a, a text box there where you can specify what your interests are. Right. Um, all right, great. Well, look, I'm, I'm looking at the time. I'm trying to honor your need to to wrap this thing up uh, early, Lance. Well, I, um, I'm just going to get up and walk off at 3.30, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, there are two things on my plate. Happy to add any other rants or other observations you want to add here. Um, one, I just I just want to address. Uh, so it's been an interesting week on, on the Wealthy On channel because um, we've had two videos that generated, I thought at least, a real emotional response um, in our viewers. Um, we had uh, one yesterday, I'll start with first, which was uh, with Andy Serwer, um, who is the editor-in-chief of Yahoo Finance. Um, it's you know the largest online financial media company in the world, right? I'm super excited to get um, Andy on for that reason alone. Also, I used to work at Yahoo Finance a million years ago, so it was sort of fun to have that connection with him. Um, but also he does what I do. He just does it on an even grander scale, right? So he talks to top experts. Um, he though talks to folks that are at the absolute pinnacle of the food chain, right? He talks to the Warren Buffetts, uh, the Ray Dalios, the Elon Musks, uh, the Jamie Dimons, et cetera. Um, I'm, I'm still trying to work my way there right now. Yeah. Um, so he's a really good, um, what I consider to be an expert of experts. And so um, I really wanted to have him on the channel to sort of to share his thinking and the thinking of those people that he talks with on a weekly basis. And there was some understandable um, reaction, I would call a little bit of an, an, an allergic one uh, to, you know, Andy's more mainstream uh, view of the markets and, 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 and those of the people that he talks to. And of course, that's expected, right? He's part of the mainstream media, right? And, and the reason why I think it's valuable to have those people on this channel is because we don't want this to become an echo chamber, 
right? Where we're just reinforcing our own opinions. Um, so we always want to be able to learn from people, especially those that are in a position to be getting primary information from the people that are really making the decisions that drive the world. Um, but also we just, even if we disagree with how the world is being run, and let's not, you and I disagree a lot with, with uh, how the world's being run. We rant every week about this, right? It's very important and instructive and useful for us to crawl in the brains of those folks who are making the decisions because we can then tell where the puck is headed. And even if we don't like where it's headed, we can say, how can I best position myself given where it's headed to make sure that A, I'm not collateral damage and maybe I can take advantage of some of this stuff, right? I see you nodding as I'm saying all this. No, no, no. It, it's 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 so valuable because, you know, again, while I was saying, like I was saying earlier, you know, what Mike and I are, are fighting about, we're not fighting. I mean, this is our debate internally. You know, how do we intentional not, debate? It's an intentional say, debate, right? Yeah. But whenever he and I both agree on an outlook, you know, my job is to try to tear that view apart and, and come up with an alternative structure. And the reason is, is because what we don't want is what you just said is, is that we fall victim to confirmation bias. And I'll, and I'll tell you something, um, you know, you have a lot of viewers that watch your watch this channel every week. And I get lots of emails from people saying, uh, you know, I just saw ABC person on the Wealthy On channel and I want to know how to put all my money into gold bullion. Right. That's OK. But the problem with that view is that if you're wrong, you're going to suffer pretty dramatic damage financially over the over a longer term period, which is the whole thing you're trying to avoid. And like we talked about before, trying to avoid a bear market can wind up costing you more money than just being in the bear market. Right. So 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 this is so the views of like Andy Sewer and others that you're going to talk to, I, I well, I hope you get more guys like him on this channel. And even when you and I are talking, I try to put a little bit more bullish spin on things a lot of times. Because I know there's a lot of views on here that are really, really, really deeply bearish. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we need to counterbalance those views so that we say, look, probabilities are that, let me just use a, a real life example, right? Probabilities are David Rosenberg is right. I love David Rosenberg. We've been drinking buddies before. Great guy, right? So if you haven't seen that interview, put that link up because that's an awesome interview, by the way. Um, but very likely he's right. But what is it out there? And this again, this is the debate Mike and I are having. I see I the problem is I completely agree with David Rosenberg's views about where we're headed over the next year. But what if he's wrong? Right? What happens if he's wrong? How do we hedge for that risk of being wrong in our portfolios so that we don't suffer a unexpected event? with our money. That's the whole purpose of this. And this is the exercise that we do every day. And this is the exercise that you can provide for us as viewers is pro by providing these different views, right. it at least allows me to think about, hey, I really like David Rosenberg's opinion. I think he's right. It seems completely logical, but I need to consider this alternative. And where am I if that alternative turns out to be the thing that actually happens? Right. And there's there's being right, and then there's being unlucky, where you could be you could have all, everything right, but there's something random happens that yeah. just negates it, right? But you can yeah. also have David Rosenberg on one side, very bearish. You could have Tom Lee on the other side, very bullish, right? And just for folks, I, I every week or two, I ping Tom Lee's folks. They <laughs> have at this point stopped <laughs> responding to me. I'm still going to keep reaching out, but it's not that yeah. we haven't tried to get him on the program. But we can have David Rosenberg over here. We can have Tom Lee over here. And they could both be wrong, yep. right? So in other words, it's not an either or. There's a whole you know spectrum of potential outcomes that could happen here. So that's this why you know both diversification and active management of just staying on top of all this stuff and seeing where things are going is so important. Because yes, David might be totally right, or maybe Tom's more, or mostly right, you know, totally right, or or maybe it's little flavors of both of their theses, you know, spread across a, a wider set of possibility distributions. Yep. So we just have to be. Super open to that. Yeah. And and having your sort of like, nope, this is the way the world works, you know, and, and is uh, blinders on um, generally is a recipe for disappointment. And, and Lance, I know you know that e even if it's not as extreme as maybe some of the, the viewers here, you know, yeah. hold, hold it. Um, and I don't mean to imply folks that that uh, AI, AI, I, I don't share 
certain perspectives and views. And when I do, I try to make it clear on this program. But but really, my job is to try to let the guest be who they are so that you can take, you know, the information they're giving you and decide how much of it you want to keep, how much of it you don't want to keep. But anyways, um, keep, keeping this from being an echo chamber and understanding what the people who are making the, the decisions in the world, whether we like them or not, um, I think is really important. I'm going to do more of it. Yeah. Absolutely. Secondly, we had a the, the other video was one um, where we had uh, a company called Diamond Standard come in. And Lance, I think I told you a little bit about this right after I had recorded the interview. I don't think you've had a chance to watch it yet. Um, but uh, so first I'll say, folks, I was just as skeptical as it seems like a lot of people were when when they heard this topic come up. Um, really? Are diamonds really? I mean, isn't that kind of like a captured market and can't they just grow them in labs? Um, you know, um, is there really any real utility there? Um, I entered the discussion with a, a, a I would say, a, a pretty prodigious amount of healthy skepticism. Um, by the end of the conversation, I just thought it was super fascinating with what they were doing. And I got the logic of what they're trying to do. This is not an endorsement. Um, I'm not saying rush out and put all your money into diamonds. Um, <laughs> but again, there was just there was a, a strong allergic reaction, which I get. Um, to a lot of people who who clearly, you know, I, I, I heard it long before the video even started playing. So I know that a lot of the folks hadn't even watched it yet and dismissed it out of hand. And look, I'm not telling you diamonds are the next greatest thing. What I'm trying to say is part of what this channel is doing, it's all about wealth building. It's when we find interesting opportunities, to the extent that there's enough viewer demand for it, I'm going to surface them for consideration when I think they're worthy of, of your time. I'll try not to waste your time with, you know, random um, tokens or you know it, with with board ape nfts or stuff like that um it, you know, unless there's a real you know compelling reason that i have yet to see um but anyways um uh and so um you know in the case of the diamonds again i'm not folks i don't i don't care if you did, just if you agree with what they're you know the, the logic behind what the the um ceo left out uh share with us and whatnot um but you know, it's not every day and that we have a lot of hard assets investors on this channel for good reason. And it's not every day that a brand new hard asset market could be disrupted like this. And so I think it's worthy of just listening to, right? And, and considering, right? And again, once you do, you can dismiss that out of hand. But my point here is, is um, even though there was some blowback to this by some people, like I said, most of which I'm not sure actually watched the video, I'm going to continue to do that as long as folks here on this channel tell me, yeah, we don't just want to talk about the problems with the markets. We want to figure out what to do with our capital. And as you have interesting potential solutions to bring to bear, please let us know. And Diamonds, you know, what's super interesting to me about that is, is there's, it's a non-correlated asset to date, right? And I think, you tell me, Lance, but I imagine most you know, capital managers would have loved a non-correlated asset coming into 2022, right? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, and look, there's a there's a huge sort of potential to disrupt this market here that would enable institutional capital to finally invest in it. And that was the whole crypto promise, you know, as well. Um, that being said, you know, the crypto space did get Bitcoin we used to be valued in the hundreds of dollars. And even though it's been super beaten up, it's still 16,000 today. So there's been some appreciation there. So anyways, again, I'm not trying to make the case for diamonds specifically. I'm just trying to say that as we find interesting solutions, to the extent this community continues to want me to do so, I'm going to try to bring them to you because at the end of the day, we're trying to be much more about solutions on this channel than we are about problems. Yes. And look, I, I, I like this idea. I told my wife about it and she said you can buy, that I can buy her diamonds anytime she wants. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. She just held out her hand and said, you know, I got 10 fingers. So go, go, go to town. <laughs> All right. Well, look, folks, in wrapping up here, um, I got a lot of feedback um, from last week's conversation about self, you know, investing in self-discovery. Mm -hmm. um, folks really like the topic, Lance. Um, I'm sure we'll pick up that thread again in the future. Um, I just want to let folks know, I, I, I mentioned that my daughter had taken it and we were sort of just talking about some of her results at a high level. What was fun is, is when you take it, they have your results in the system forever. So after my daughter got her report, I asked, hey, do you still have my results? And they said, yes. And I said, hey, can I get like a refresher report on it? And they said, sure. So I just had it a couple of days ago. Um, and if folks are interested, um, I'm happy to make them publicly available. I'll put them up on Wealthy on somewhere on a page um, where you can see, I don't know if you can see the 
you know, this pretty long report they give me based upon my results. Um, this is the the printout report, but then they also sit down with you for an hour and you know go through in detail the results. You get to ask a lot of questions. They provide an awful lot more color on what the results are telling them. So if you're considering taking the test and would like to see what the user experience is like, I'm happy to put both of this document as well as part of uh, the video uh, report I did with a woman. There's some stuff we got into that that doesn't relate to my results that that probably shouldn't be shared. But uh, I'll at least put up the part about my results if folks want to see it. So, folks, if you do, let me know in the comments section below. If if enough folks want to do it, I'll put it up there. And on next week, I'll tell you where you can go get that URL. So just in wrapping up here, Lance, um, I want to recap for folks some of the resources we talked about. Um, first, if you want to uh, listen to that retirement planning seminar from Lance's uh, personal finance guys, go to wealthion.com slash retirement planning. Uh, very importantly, if you want to take advantage of the fixed income sleeve that Lance and I talked about earlier. Um, get yourself in the system for that. You can go learn more about that by filling out the form at wealthion.com slash fixed income. And uh, if you enjoy these uh, weekly market recaps as much as Lance and I do, and if you are as amazed as I am that we have finished this one at just an hour and a half right on schedule, do me a favor, support this channel by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Lance, thank, Lance, thanks so much for hanging with me for yet another great discussion, buddy. Yep. See you next week. Absolutely. All right, everybody else. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next week.